So first of all, thank you to the Sustain Research Hub for inviting me to give a talk at this conference. Um, and as you can see, my talk is on, do we actually know how to improve sustainability? So I thought I'd go back to the generic, what is sustainability, find the definition. And we have a couple of different dictionary definitions. So we have the ability to maintain a rate or level. And then we have the more uh, environmentally focused one, which mentions natural resources and ecological balance. I've underlined the word rate there in the first uh, definition because I feel it's important to make sure that we understand that sustainability doesn't, isn't just about keeping things the same, but it's about potentially encouraging growth at a sustainable level. These images uh, I thought were interesting. If you just Google the word sustainability, these are the first three images that come up and we see that there's a, a real focus on green and we always hear the, the phrase green steel around in our industry at the moment, which has reasonable credentials. Um, there's very little focus on the effect that this, this word has on hu the human life and human interaction and how we exist in the world. And at the bottom there, you can see um, a quote from the UN World Commission on Environmental Development by uh, Gro Harlem Brutland. And um, within their report, they define sustainability as a need to meet uh, the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So in terms of needs, what could that mean? We have this lovely graphic here that I've blown up to a level that it's distorted and I apologize for the lack of decent resolution there. But we can see all the different aspects that create life and, and, our, and how we would want to live, standards of living. And with this idea that from, from the, the UN report that the idea of sustainability is to enable future generations to meet their needs, one of the key aspects of that is we don't know what their needs will be. So do we have a social responsibility for timely technology development so that they have knowledge and infrastructure and technology to deliver what they may need in their lifetimes? But also keeping things as open and flexible as possible. So currently, how do industry, government and consumer get their moves towards sustainability right? Now, I've made a, a probably quite a harsh statement here from, from an industry perspective, but ultimately they're looking for viable market shares. An industry, a, a business has a responsibility to make money for either their shareholders or to continue to exist for their, for their workers if they're more worker driven. And, and in terms of being able to influence views and understanding and, and how sustainability is driven, besides lobbying, all they can really do is optimize activity within the landscape they are given. And one of the big ones recently, obviously, when I say recently, last 20, 30 years, carbon taxation. And, and that led to a lot of offshoring, as we know. And then we can see loads of people leaving the shores during the war, but that was the best picture I could find to uh, uh, represent offshoring of, of industry. It's with consumers, what can consumers do? They can interface with education, um, most notably news, documentaries, uh, word of mouth. These are our two most prominent people probably influencing that. So on the right there, we have uh, National Treasure, Sir David Attenborough. And as we know, he presented Blue Planet. Um, there's the uh, evidence in there of the influence of plastic on ocean life. And we generated the war on plastic and consumers trying to get to zero waste shops. Um, we had policy interventions on plastic and we see um, drive of uh, consumer response or producer responsibility on single use plastic coming. And ultimately, consumers can speak with their wallets. I mean, some of them do sit down in the middle of the road and disrupt traffic. And, and that's another approach, I guess, whether, you, whether you're for or against that. And then policymakers, what can they do? Well, they respond to international pressure. When we've seen that at COP26, people putting their name on lines just so they don't look bad. Um, but they also have a responsibility to their public, the, the view and the vision of the public. And they listen to experts. Um, but whether we agree with uh, the, the understanding of experts that they're giving or, or, or they're explaining that well enough is a, is a different matter of a discussion. Um, so as an example of something that's worked and cuts across industry, cuts across consumers and, and policy, um, we've all probably, or at least most of us, have walked into Tesco and bought a sandwich and were confronted with this traffic light system that was put in, the, put in, in around 2005, I think. Um, and ultimately, this is, this is an attempt to drive sustainability of health within, within the populace. And when, that's why we have these percentage numbers at the bottom that represent the uh, contribution that this, this good would have to your, to your health or your maximum intake for the day. 
And that's driven by a complexity of understanding. There's, there's a lot of work on measuring quality of life and health and, and what you put in your mouth uh, uh, and a focus on the important factors, trying to dive down on what is important and, and, and overarching aspects for that. Benchmarking against the standard of what we think a human should eat. And there can a campaign of education and which is conveyed to the consumer of the importance and how to how to actually use this information again we we that's sustainability in terms of keeping things the same but what about if you want change what about if you want to be exceptional and here we see two exceptional individuals that have had to divert drastically away from this, this average sustainability of nutritional intake so we have done done more three times uh uh strongest world's strongest woman and elliot kitchogi who we all know uh, broke the two-hour marathon uh, a couple of years ago. Whether you agree with that world record or not is, is up to you in the conditions that he achieved that in, but still remarkable nonetheless. So in terms of then what would that look like from a sustainability perspective rather than just a, a nutritional sustainability perspective? And we have, um, over the last few years, there's been a general widening of the view of sustainability away from just environmental factors, which we see represented here from an ecological um, circle, but we also see this economy circle, which has played huge factors in the, the decisions and sustainability aspects of the last 18 months with the pandemic. And we have a social aspect, so, you know, do, do the materials offer value to consumers? Are they sourced responsibly and are they safeguarding future generations and, and providing people the answers they want? Some of these are quite difficult, you know, we're interfacing here between physical sciences, business logistics, and social sciences. So how do we measure and quantify these things? And that's what I'm here to talk a little bit more in detail about is um, I was lucky to be funded by the Sustained Steel Research Hub for an ECR um, call uh, to start working on the Sustainable Investment Assurance Model. Um, and this is a quantification tool or an attempt to start building a framework for quantification around these three aspects diverted into to five separate um, areas here that you can see just to make it slightly more manageable for myself but also maybe slightly more uh, relatable to a consumer to be able to pick out the individual factors that they might be most interested in um, and want to drive from their wallet the tools are available i should know so it's not just self-promotion um, so what drives SIAM? Here on the left, you can see a graphic that many of us will have seen before. So the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, and there's a, um, 17 goals listed here. And they, they can all be kind of attributed to, to one of these five pillars of uh, SIAM, um, with uh, in th things such as people buying goods because they want to be healthy or they want to be well. So the, the goods have functionality from number three there. Um, decent work and economic growth, so the fiscal sustainable sustainability of the business, and so on and so forth, um, are some traditional examples of what you might include from a consumer perspective into those pillars. So as a case study of using this framework, and which was funded by the initial uh, sustain uh, input, was to look at rebar and rebar's use within the UK and how it may be uh, and, and where we where we source our reinforcing by far from. So the UK consumes about 1.2 million tonnes of rebar per annum, roughly half of which is imported. However, we do have significant production in the UK with a similar capacity of the overall consumption. However, in 2013, about a third of UK rebar was imported from China specifically, and this has dropped, and you know, that can, could be directly uh, attributed to the EU anti-dumping legislation which came in. However, in 2019, the largest import volumes were still from outside of the EU with Turkey, UK, Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. So taking a view of comparing international imported rebar and its sustainability credentials versus a domestic example, um, slightly anonymized to, to, to remove IP issues and some of the data uh, sensitivities that's in there, but we look at imported rebar and we'll specifically look at Turkey because it's slightly fairer to compare against Turkey than some of the other um, regions that we import re rebar for at the moment and they make rebar by using scrap DRI um, and, uh, in, in electric art furnaces uh, but they also use traditional integrated groups using electricity coal natural gas as their energy sources whereas within the UK we use scrap 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 and generally melt this in the electric art furnace. And at the bottom there, you can see classical examples of information that we'd use within ISO standard LCA analysis. 
um, such as the amount of CO2 uh, produced in production, but also transport materials and the CO2 of that transport costs. And then we have further considerations within Siam, material replacement, sourcing additional raw materials, so on and so forth. And ultimately, this becomes very complex and interlinked between the supply chain of that material. So can we simplify it? We need a directory of intervention that tells us where we should look first to make improvements so that we can generate data integrity. Also, how do we display this data in a way that's meaningful for consumers to trust, policymakers to act on and so forth? And what, what we came up with was benchmarking against the global average, putting a number between 0 and 100, 50 being the average, and ind indicate a trajectory of performance. Now, if you remember Donna and uh, Kogi from uh, earlier wanted to create change. We want to create change. We don't want things to stay the same because we know that things aren't sustainable. And as an example within this, we see Turkey and to triple domestic use of coal in the next 20 years, whereas the UK signed the 2026 Coal Alliance at the top uh, and plan to decarbonise their grid by 2035. So this leads us to generating two numbers. On the left of these numbers here for environment, we have the current state. And on the right, we have a projection of where, they, where these numbers may go based on large scale infrastructure or activity within the businesses and the supply chains. And you can see that currently Turkey is relatively competitive, slightly worse than domestic. Uh, produce rebar from the interventions coming they are expected to be drastically worse whereas the domestic uh, supplies are expected to improve and then just looking at a couple of the other tier, uh, pillars within Siam as examples we've got synergy where we consider things like circularity uh, reuse remanufacture and this is something that Turkey's uh, rebar has um, great profits from because they use DRI and they material is also, their rebar is also produced by the blast furnace buff fruit. They don't have as higher levels of residuals within their steel. So from a reuse or circularity point of view at the recycling level, not from the reuse manufacturing point of view, that steel st still holds much more value for application in other, uh, other areas. And that ultimately is what dominates Turkey's performance here on their, oh, sorry, uh, on their vector here on the 60 side. However, looking at improving scrap sorting and, and uh, aspects such as uh, trials that have been done on circular um, construction with UK sources, there is an expected increase, significant increase in the synergy of that production. And, so, and then finally looking at the ethical point of view, this is where we consider things such as human and animal welfare, sector specific credentials, and specifically for rebar, we've looked at responsible steel and eco reinforcement, which are international standards. And then also the contribution of the efforts from with the production itself, but also the companies, the education. Ultimately, we can't improve sustainability if people don't understand it and know how to improve it long term. The challenge is the delivery of this uh, this bit of work uh, were kind of twofold. So one is what I talked about there is an incredibly diverse area of expertise from people that look at emissions, zero waste, et ethological and climate issues. We've got financial issues and human rights experts, which I don't claim to be an expert on at all. Um, so how do we bring these people together? How do we get the expertise into this to give it its credentials to, to be useful? So the current aspect, the current pathways we have are through collaboration, through people directly or through policy um, and government intervention so we could look at applying for UKRI funding to fund people to work on this but also we have um, direct cash which could be possible from industrial partners or, or regional remits which wish to increase their sustainability and on the other side we had data um, and I'm sure this has been said by other people uh, many times, but um, Jeff Brooks, who spoke yesterday morning, I remember in 2016, he was talking about actual plant processes, but you saying you can't improve what you can't measure, and that's stuck with me forever. And I think it implies very clearly to sustainability as well. And two of the key aspects that Siam found, but also offers us, is it's a, it's a framework to measure against um, and a method of assessing what factors we need to include. And as such, it's a powerful tool to highlight what areas of directed data are missing and which we should be working on to improve our understanding. And the other aspect within data was um, at what point can we share data? You know, at what point does it become commercially sensitive and the quality of that data is available? And as mentioned by a couple of people through the uh, conference, we're, we have been exploring this. We were looking at blockchain blockchain technology and we've been having discussions between ourselves, Salsa and Enchain on how application of blockchain 
could um, improve the data uh, included in such a measurement. And from Swansea perspective, that's being worked on or and discussed with Arnold and QC, who and Arnold presented earlier. So the hope is that we, you know, we can generate something that has quality data to consumer trust, but also a rating of how good the data is that goes into that, so that people can actually appreciate whether it's a useful number or not. So the next steps for SIAM is we were recently funded by TFI Network Plus to start looking at its application with other foundation industries, including glass, cement and chemicals. Um, we need to continue to ass assess the appetite for such a tool, talking to further industrial partners, consumers and policymakers, increase the level of understanding and complexity. And as I said, this is far too broad an aspect for one person to be an, uh, an expert in. Look at where data sharing is uh, can stop and start and continue to build a precedent of use of this tool and other tools um, uh, for its dissemination of knowledge. So I just wanted to finish up by saying thank you to um, uh, Sustain and TFI Network Plus for starting the funding of such work and, and support from um, people on the right hand side there, specifically highlighting Louis Brimacum um, as he uh, offered as a, a, as a consultant rather than an organisation to support the TFI Network Plus submission, which I'm very grateful for. And finally, I think it's always important to practice what you preach. So. Um, with Christmas coming up, people might be looking for stocking fillers. And if you want to engage more people in your family or friends, these are three suggestions of books ranging from the right hand side, very more technical, uh, broad aspects but, uh, where you may be more interested in the material specifically. Everyday Life with their How Bad Is Your Banana books, quite an amusing title. And finally, on the left hand side, one of my idols, Bo Miles, produced a book, The Backyard Adventurer, where he uh, and he has a lovely YouTube channel you could look up and he makes things like a, an office out of junk in his garden and so on and so forth. So exploring a person's interaction with its environment and also opportunities for going harking back to, you know, earlier 1900s where people were more focused on reusing, getting the most out of their facilities uh, and their, their materials. And uh, as a last thing, if you all were interested in improving your sustainability, the one thing we can remember is a lot of complexity around swapping things, but we always know we can just turn the light out when we leave the thing. Thank you.